Okay, today is Tuesday. Yud Dalid Shvat. Yesterday was Yud Gimel Shvat, tomorrow is Tuba Shvat. I wasn't here yesterday, I'm not here tomorrow. Um, so let me just tell you something about these two dates. Yesterday was the yard site of the Rebbe Tzestenes Sada, the Friedrich Rebbe's mother, the previous Rebbe's mother. And um, she passed away in Tafshim Bays, 1942. And her son, the Rebbe, was in Chicago. And I just saw somebody sent around the uh, Rishime, I think in the name of Label Groner, that the Chassidim did not want the Rebbe to go to Chicago because they remembered that when the Rebbe Rashab mother passed away, he was also away from Lubavitch. They sort of felt that the Rebbe is going to be around, she'll be okay. The Rebbe went to Chicago and she passed away. On Shabbos, Yudimu Shvat Tov Shimbe, 1942, was Shabbos. And it was for her that they bought the plot. The Aguda Sidi Chabad bought the plot in Montefiore Cemetery. The Rebbe went and he bought it. He put down a thousand dollars, which was a lot of money, for a deposit for that spot, for that chelker for Agudas Chasidi Chabad. He went with Kazanovsky. And of course, the story is that she passed away exactly the same way as her mother in law. And all the details are striking. What happened was the Rebbe Zinifka passed away on Friday. Yud Shvat, Tafresh Dalit. Last year was 100 years, uh, 1914. And. Uh, she passed away on a Friday morning. The Rebbe Rashab was away. I think he was in he was in Menton. He was in France, if I'm not wrong. And what happened was that she had been sick, and she was actually feeling a little bit better. And she was feeling so much better that the Rebbe Ayats wrote to his father that there's no reason for him to come home. He was thinking to come home because she'd been feeling sick all week. And then she was pushed feeling better. So the Rebbe sent his father a telegram, he can stay in Menton. And then she passed away very suddenly. She, he went into her Friday morning, just like he still davening, she davened, he handed her a siddin, and then after davening, he took the siddin back from her. And midach sech, the maister was that he gave her a glass of water and she made a bracha shahakal. He took her siddin to put it down on the mantle. He took her siddin to put it on the mantle. And when he came back, she was gone. That's how she passed away. So he sent his father three telegrams that day. One telegram said, your mother's not doing well. The second telegram said, she's very not doing well. And the third telegram said, there's no reason for you to come. The Levi was on Friday. It was a short Friday, it was very cold. And the Rebbe Rayats made all the arrangements. And uh, he was so emotional, he was so upset about her histalkus, that Pasha, he couldn't walk. Two Bachar were holding him. And they heard him muttering to himself as they came back from the Levaya. First he said, the crown from the Meshpachis are up. That means the crown was lifted from the family. And then later he said, Ah, Agastin Ganeid in the Shabbos. Imagine. Hours after she passed, I guess, in other words, she'll be by Shabbos, she'll be in Ganeidin. Agastin Ganeid in the Shabbos. The Friedrich Rebbe said this by his grandmother's Levaya. She, she was a Zivik Shaini. She was a second wife of the Rebbe Marash. The Rebbe's first wife passed away shortly after the wedding, months after the wedding. So the Rebbe Ayats made the decision to bury her in the men's section. You don't bury two women married to the same man in the same cemetery. So she buried her to Coppins, head to head the Rebbe Marash, in the men's section. And that's where she lays today. There's a Matzeva. Right after Shabbos, he got on a train and he went to Menton. He went to see his father. And when it came to his father, the first words out of his father's mouth were Vostid Gilek. Where did you put her? And he said to Kottens, Het had the Rebbe Marash. And the Rebbe Rashab said, Good, I would have moved her even if he had not made a condition. And then he described her Petita. And his mother, the Rebbe Tishnam Sada, got very excited. She clapped her hands and said, Oi, halavai ba mira zoya. I wish by me would be the same. And that's exactly what happened. It was Shabbos morning. The Friedrich Rebbe was away in Chicago. And the Rebbe, the Ramash, as he was called then, stayed in New York. The Rebbe stayed in New York. And she was in the middle of davening. She was holding Nishmas. The Rebbe has it written down in his own journal. The Rebbe wrote it down himself in his diary. I don't remember precisely. But the Toichin is she asked him for a glass of water, which he brought her. And I think she gave him a bracha. And then she passed away. Right after drinking a shakra, and what making a bracha. Maybe she even gave him a bracha, but I don't remember that detail. Naturally, after Shabbos, the Rebbe was informed, and the Rebbe wanted to come home. 
and uh, they showed him a list of people who had to go into Yechidus and they never waited a day longer to have people Yechidus was in Oina and then he came back to New York they found later in her will that she had written that she's Moichel on the Dabin for Yamad. she knew how hard it was for Yechidus to speak and she wrote in her will that it's not necessary for the Fidi Kev to daven for her. And after a little while, a week or two or three, the Rebbe stopped davening for his mother and a Pshmuel of it and daven for her. For him, instead. Now, the, the thing that blows my mind, the part of this whole story which really blows my mind, is this. The Fidi Kev came back by train from New York Sunday night. The Rebbe that Amash, the Rebbe of Gazun Zayin, went to the train to greet him. And he got on the train. And the Levaya had been held. The Rebbe was still being held. And the Rebbe Rayatz, the first words that the Friedrich Rebbe said to the Rebbe, what do you think they were? What the first thing your mother's laying, literally between heaven and earth. What are the first words the Friedrich Rebbe said to the Rebbe when you saw him Sunday night? The first words out of the Friedrich Rebbe's mouth were, quote, Dartin is Gevena Emesa Hazoza. Which means my trip to Chicago was successful. <laughs> The idea that he's an oval and an and that his mother's waiting for him for the Levaya was not on the agenda. What was on the agenda was the Yiddishkeit work that the Rebbe and the Rebbe were doing together. Darkness given Emes HaZoza. That was the feeling that Rebbe said. It's a remarkable story. It's a remarkable thing. He ended up not even going to the Levaya. The doctors didn't let him and all kinds of pressure was brought. He stayed in 770. He never ever went to his mother's tea. The first time he went to Montefiore Cemetery was for his own Levaya. And um, he used to send letters, Pedianus and Tzian, and he used to write in them based on the settle which I'm going to read in my room, he used to say, because he didn't want Fremde, Fremde to see what he was writing. Uh, so the Levi was Monday. Tezvav, he says, Tu B'Shvat, Yudimu Shvat. Now tomorrow is Tu B'Shvat, and of course, Tu B'Shvat, or Rishon Ilon, Rishon Ilonis. And Mestama, you know, the, the Machlech is Beishamah and Beishilo. And Beishamah says, that uh, Tu B'Shvat is the Shchedish. The Shon of the Il the Shchedish. And Beit Hillel says, the Shon of the Il is Tu B'Shvat. And what's the basis for the Machlaikis? The basis of Machlaikis is, can you make a Rosh Hashanah when you don't yet see any signs of it? Right? The trees hibernate. They go to sleep. And when it comes, the new, when the spring comes, and at the throw, we're talking now, of course, the trees wake up, which is why trees have rings. And when the tree wakes up, and the tree has its new ring, it begins the Shchedish. But two weeks later, the Lashon that Chazal bring is that the sap, the moisture, which is under the ground and the roots, starts going back into the tree, the Shchedish. Two weeks later, you see the first blossoms, the first fruits, the first whatever it is. We wait two weeks, and we don't make the Shoshana on the Shchedish, we make the Shoshana on Tu B'Shvat, because that's when you're able to see it. You're able to see that there's blossoms, that there's new uh, signs of life, as it were. The Rebbe has these letters which he wrote in the early 40s explaining to Bishvat and he makes the point that the reason for trees is fruit. Why do you have trees? The trees should produce fruit. And why do you have fruit? They should produce more trees. So even though the life of the tree is not in the fruit, Faket, the fruit is a cost for the tree, the point of the tree is the fruit. So I just want to say two points about a fruit. The first point about a fruit is that it produces another tree, which is of course the point of it all. Life continues. And from one seed you can have an Ein Sof. But there's another thing about a fruit. And the second thing about a fruit is that fruit are for people to eat. Fruit are the Eden or the Tainu. Fruit are for people to eat. Which uh, brings out something very, very, very important. Everybody understands that there's a cycle of life. Everybody understands that there's a cycle of life. But the Goyesha cycle of life is a circle. A circle means everything feeds everything else, and there's really no difference between one part of the circle and another part of the circle. The Toyota cycle of life also is a cycle of life, but it's not a circle. It's a straight line. Where the mineral feeds the plant, that feeds the animal, that feeds the person, and the person serves the Abishta. And the Abishta created his world that there should be a cycle of life which is, which is cyclical, everything should feed everything, everything needs everything and everything feeds everything. But the pnimius of that circle, although the chitzainius is that it's a circle, 
the Pneumia says that everything should be raised up. The Abish created an earth, so there should be plants and fruits, so there should be an animal, there should be a human being, and the human being should serve the Abish. And it is this second concept of the cycle of life which is the basis for Reish Hashanah. In other words, the reason time has units and that there's heads, that there's beginnings, that there's ends, and that you're starting over is only because of Adam. If there'd be no people on this planet, there wouldn't be a world. But if there'd be no people on this planet, there'd be no Rosh Hashanah, no beginning. So it would just be, everything just keeps on going. The reason you have a stop and a start and the Rosh Hashanah is because there's a human being who serves the Eivishter. And the human being serves the Eivishter with everything that he has, including the time itself. And because the human being serves the Eivishter, even with the time itself, the time itself is divided up into ordinary time and into special time. So you're talking about Rosh Hashanah, La'ilah, and you talk about two Bishvat, it's being Rosh Hashanah is for the tree and for the fruit, but it's being Rosh Hashanah Le'ilon is for the fact that the fruit is feeding a person. The Ibish to made a new year for trees that the tree should be renewed to feed a person, the person should be able to serve the Ibish to. And that's really the Pneumius, the meaning of the words, other mates has saw there. Other mates has saw there, there's, a, there's a lot of different types, other mates has saw there means that the point of Eitz has is Adam. And you have to see to it that the Eitz HaSadah should serve Adam and not the other way around. So there you have it. I gave you a vart on your Gimel Shvat. And I gave you a vart on Tu Shvat. And now we're going to do back, back to Yud Shvat. Now over the last couple of weeks, we did our uh, Yud Shvat preparation based of course on the limitations of time. What has to happen now is that we need to pay our bills. Which means say we did all the Yud Shvat stuff that we needed to do for this year, pay the hay, we did the Lamed hay and other things. This is a mind from Tav Shem Mem Gimel, 1983. As you know, with Hashem's help and great kindness, we learned the Maimarim of the Rebbe al We go in order, we learn the Maimarim of the Rebbe backwards. So we did Mem Ches, I love to, I love to count, it gives me such pleasure. Mem Ches, Mem Zayin, Mem Vav, Mem Hay, Mem Dalad. Five whole years of the Rebbe Maimarim, we learned that, by the way, they're all available online, you can take them. And now we're doing uh, Mem Gimel. And we're holding Basi Lagani Mem Gimel. So I need to explain to you what this means. This year, Tafshin Ayin Hei, 19, what are we holding here? 2015, is Pedic Hei. The, um, the uh, Pedic associated with this year is chapter 5, Bepama Revias, the fourth time around, chapter 5. Okay, now, but this is not Pedic Hei. This is Pedic Yud Gimel. This is chapter 13. Because this is following, we're not following a pattern of my mother, my Basi Lagani. We're following the pattern of my mother that we're learning based on the yearly cycle. And based on the yearly cycle, this is Pedic Yud Gimel. So what's going to happen today is as follows. I am going to reintroduce Basi Lagani to you, okay? I'll give you a short version of Basi Lagani. You heard it twice, you heard it a third time. Or you heard it three times, you heard it a fourth time. <laughs> Whatever number of times we did it. And then we're going to learn the prefix of this mind. Because what used to happen every year was every Maimah began Basi Lagani. And every Maimah, the Rebbe would journey through the Maimah from the beginning until the Paydek, which was exclusive to that year. So by the time the Rebbe was holding in the 13th year, we had to review almost three quarters of Basi Lagani as part of the prefix. The Rebbe does not get to the relevant Paydek until page Pei Beis. Two and a half pages are prefix. So we're going to be learning in Mitzvah Hashem the beginning of this Maimit. But let me sort of speak, let me set up Basi Lagani from Ephraim Kloli. I want to tell you the basic point of Basi Lagani. And then we'll journey through the Maimit until the point that we're holding, of course, with the help of the Abishta. Number one, Basi Lagani has two basic messages. There's two basic points of Basi Lagani. The first point in Basi Lagani is, but also limited for Shachanti Basayim. To make the Abish to the base of Mikdash. And to make the Abish to the base of Mikdash, which is ultimately the whole world. The Abish to the base of Mikdash in Shalain, there was a small space. The Avoid of also the Mikdash Vishanti Besoycham is to make the whole world into a base of Mikdash. How do you make the world into a base of Mikdash? The basic message is I guess Kafi Vishap. You make the world into a base of Mikdash by struggling with the world, by engaging with the world as opposed to isolating yourself from the world. Now, in Iskafiv is Habcha, the Rebbe gave us three examples, Karbonis, 
Shtus, which is the topic of this year, Tavshinayin Hey, and transforming Sheker to Kedesh. The second half of Basi Lagani is about who makes the Beis Amikdash. And the Beis Amikdash is made by the Tzivas Hashem, by the soldiers. An army consists of three classes. That's how this Maima works. There's a Melech, there's a king, there's the Sariyat Tzavit, there's the officers, and then there's the Ishchayel, there's the common soldier. When a king engages in war, depending on what kind of war it is, sometimes he trusts his generals. And sometimes he trusts nobody. And in those instances where he trusts nobody, he's Bach Nisasat for Betaksisi Mochom, he gets a vow personally. What's the difference? If he's fighting a war, Lishlil Shol of a lover's vase for conquest, to acquire more, he trusts his generals. But if he's fighting a war, of Nitzachah, and if he's fighting a war of survival, then he trusts no one and he engages himself. So the Basi Ligani describes a Melech who personally gets involved in a war, and the reason he's getting personally involved in the war is talking about Muhammad Nitzachah. So he says the king is personally involved, that's number one. Number two, he's Mavaz Beis Kolo Eitzidis, that means to say he opens up and distributes all of the treasure. And number three, that is Mashlechai of Minevi. That means to say the king actually gives away his life in order to win the war. Most of the second half of the Maimon, the second half of the Maimon, you'll see the teacher, most of it talks about the second thing. And the second thing is that he's Mavaz Beskola Eitzis. He distributes, he gives out all the treasure. So here we have a Maimon, Basi Lagani, and I'm going to start learning with you momentarily. Let's get a very quickly journey through the first point, which is the Shkafi Vesabra. And move on to the second point of Tzivis Hashem. And he's going to start talking about the Bizbos HaOitzvis, that the king dispenses of the treasure with, with, a, with a recklessness. But the Rebbe is going to do something which the Rebbe does a lot. And on a certain level, it makes you crazy. And in another level, it really gets you. The Rebbe is going to deliberately mistranslate the mind. <laughs> On purpose, he's going to explain the Maimed, as they say in Yeshivish, Befeidish, not like the Maimed was meant. He's going to spin the Maimed in a direction which was not intended, because they ever want to say something different. And that's what makes this so interesting, this Maimed. So, I'm going to start from the beginning, I'm going to learn with you from the beginning, and we're only going to get as far as the review, we're going to review the Maimed. I am going to show you how the Rebbe misinterprets the free of the Rebbe's mind, and I'm going to leave you on a cliff. That's where we're going to stop. Today is Tuesday. We end on Thursday. I'm hoping, I'm not promising, I'm hoping that on Thursday we'll complete the mind. My intent is so that we should finish the Bible together. In other words, we're going to learn a lot more Thursday than today. But that's my intent. But today I'm going to give you the introduction. There's a couple of ideas that the Rebbe mentions that are a bit different or a bit unusual, a bit distinct, and then we're going to move on. Okay, so let's begin from the beginning. This is 1983. Tov Shin Mem Gibel. The Rebbe is saying a Maimed on Pedek Shleish. I said the 13th chapter of Basi Lagani for the second time around. So he begins, Basi Lagani, I have come back to the garden that used to be mine. My sister, my bride. In other words, the Yidin. And he brings the Medrash. As the Medrash says that the Shekhinah was once here. And then the Yidin did Avedes, people did Avedes, and the Shekhinah left all the way till the Rikiya Shri. And then the Shekhinah came back down over the course of seven generations. And the seventh generation was Mesha Rabbeinu. Mesha Rabbeinu brought the Shekhinah back down. So if you look on page P, it's about ten lines into the page. At the beginning of the line it says, when the Abish that created the world, the highest level of Shina was on this earth. And that's the level that returned by Mesha Rabbeinah by Har Sina, Shimamshikim Lamata. Maybe the three Rikh Rabbah brings in his mind the following quote is that means that they say there is an expansion of Yekara the Kutchabrihu, the glory of Akadish Borahu, Bekulu Omen in all of the world. The Pirush Bekulu Almanhu, what does it mean? 
at the glory of HaKadosh Baruch Hu expands in all of the worlds, Shubakulu Aum in the Shavet, in all of the worlds in an equal way. Shazem Moira, which shows Al Gaydel HaEloy De Madre the great level of this level, Shibachinas Eid, it's a level of light. Shalemaila Mishaychus La'elam, it's all together above. Any relativism to the world, Bechina Sevev, it's hidden from the world. Shalachain, Eifan Ham Shachasehu, the way it comes down is Bechala Elamis. Bishave in all of the worlds in an equal way. And the Rebbe continues. The Zehu Gam sits. Iki Ashkina Betachtainim Haisa is a level of light which is in all the worlds equally, which is the Madrega of Sevev. This is why Ham Shachas Eir Zen Nikre Beshem is Talpit. The denotation for the bringing down of this light is the word histalkus. Now, ask an average Jew, what does histalkus mean? Histalkus means to go away. A tzaddik passes away, we call it histalkus, that means he left this earth. But Hasidus doesn't translate the word histalkus as a departure. How does Hasidic trans- Hasidus translate the word histalkus? Histalic, an expansion of the glory of the Baruch of the Omen and all the world, says the Rebbe. It's a revelation of light. Of light, pardon me. Which is hidden from all the worlds. Which is available on this earth in a way called Reimimus. And you look in footnote 7, you see, this says in Tayyid Erev, not the Rebbe already. This is how the Rebbe tries to the word Nistalk. You know that a few weeks, or even less than a few weeks, after the Rebbe Rayats passed away, the Rebbe said once publicly, as divas taichen histalkus, as the smain tavegin zen in prayer if you translate the word distalkus and it means to go away, you're a fool. You're a prayer, you're a wild person. Because we know what the word distalkus means. And we know what the word distalkus means based on what the Fidic Kabbalah says in the Bible. Distalkus means revealed. But distalkus means to go away. And the answer is distalkus means to be revealed in a uniform way. Everywhere equal. A light which is revealed everywhere equally has to be higher than all of the worlds together. And the Rebbe adds, not only higher than all of the worlds, higher than a relationship with any other world. In other words, it's a light of godliness which is true all by itself. And its revelation is called histalkos because it's not previously. You cannot relate internally to an infinite light. You can only relate internally to a finite light. So when there's a revelation of an infinite light to you, it's hovering. The Hebrew word for hovering would be hashra, or kedusha. The Aramaic word for it is histalkus, available in an indirect way. So that's why you call it tzaddik histalkus, a histalkus, because when a tzaddik passes away, he's available to the world in an indirect way. And by the same token, the level of godliness which a yid reveals through a scaphi of his hapka by struggling with Elam Azad is also called histalkus because it's a revelation of godly light which is indirect. So the Rebbe says the avoid is a scaphi of his hapka, you struggle with Elam Azad. And the reward is Dida Betachtedim. You bring the Abish of Bagan into this world. What is the Abish that you bring Bagan into this world? In the Friedrich Rebbe calls it Eira Sevev Kalam, an indirect level of godly life. The Rebbe says it means a life which has no Shaykhaz to ailments whatsoever, and it's called his thoughts. So, therefore, if you want to know the bottom line, the bottom line is that you could be involved in holy things, and you could be involved in a struggle with Eilam Azim. And by the way, we don't necessarily have a choice in that matter, right? The Abish that makes these decisions for us. When a person is involved with this world and he struggles with this world, whether it's his choice or whether it's what the Abish that gives him, the bottom line is when a Yid is engaging with the struggle in this world, he doesn't feel very good spiritually. But what he's achieving, the istalguta do yata mishvacha ochra, the Zaya says that the Benini, the Balchuva struggle, brings down a higher light than the tzaddik's glory. The tzaddik experiences great lights, but the tzaddik doesn't struggle. The Balchuvah and the Benini bring, it is very bumpy, very, very, uh, what's the word? Inefficient and not pretty, but he's bringing down a higher light. And that higher light is called his stoutness. And Basi Lagani means that this highest of lights was here and left, and it comes back, Adai Eskafi Veshab. And the Rebbe goes on to the next paragraph. The Rebbe goes on to the next paragraph. And he says, Next paragraph, please. Page, page, second paragraph. Vezehu ma. This is why. One of the key points of Meishar Abeinu. 
who asiyas ha mishkan is the making of the mishkan. Now you know, one of the things that we struggle with when we learn Basi Lagani is we start of the Maimah talking about tzaddikim and we end of the Maimah talking about us. And you're never sure, so what does the tzaddik do and what is the, uh, what is the tzaddik's job and what is our job and so on. And uh, it's, it's not such a simple question. What is the function of the tzaddik? What is the function of the ordinary Jew? In, I saw in one Maimah and I, I forgot the details but the close and you need is tzaddikim build the Yevish to the Beis HaMikdash. We bring karbonis in the Beis HaMikdash that's already been built. When you learn Basi Lagani, there's this constant interplay. What's the tzaddik's job? What's everybody's job? Or to use the example from the marshal, yeah, there's a king and there's a soldier. What's the king's role? What's the general's role? And what's the common soldier's role? They all have different roles. When you talk about Dira Betach we you're talking about making this world the home for HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Ayyaz Kafi Vizhabcha, you also have these distinct roles. What does a tzaddik do? And what does a common person do? And if I'm not mistaken, the Rebbe says that's why you have two psukim. In the beginning of the mind, the Basra Gad, there's two psukim. One pasuk is, and the other pasuk is, Tzadikim Yishu Aras, the Yishkin Ula Ada Leho. And I think that the Medrash brings both of these psukim. And I'm speaking from memory, and I didn't look it up, that the Rebbe says the difference in these two psukim is one is speaking about the role of the Tzadik, the Nasi Hadar specifically, his particular task. And the second is how the generation in following the Nasi Adar carries out what the Tzadik and the Nasi Adar initiates. But not in all my modern Basi Lagani does it ever start talking these distinctions. It just gets to the point. The point is, you got to build a base Amitosh. Here, the Rebbe singles out Meshach, he focuses on Meshach Abbey. He says, Meshach Abbey knew a CS and Mishkin. Meshach Abbey knew the Mishkin. The Nesef al Mashach, Sivoy al Asiyas and Mishkin, Hoyde Meshach Abbey. First of all, the commandment to build the base Amitosh is through Meshach Abbey. Now, four lines in the bottom of page P. It says the Rebbe. After Meshach Rabbeinu instructed how to build the Mishkan, they couldn't put it up. Meshach Rabbeinu Atme, the erection, the standing up, the final construction of the base of Mikdash was to Meshach Rabbeinu. So it's ironic. Meshach Rabbeinu did not able to make it. You know what? Meshach was not able to take a hammer and a chisel and build. He gave instructions and then it was built by Bitzal. After it was all complete, he assembled it. He put it together. This was Meshach Rabbeinu's job. But for some reasons, the Abisha did not allow him to participate physically in the construction, except to put it together once it was all done. Why? Three lines from the bottom of page. Pay. The key of the Mishkan is also the Mikdash for Shechanti Betech. The Abisha needs a sanctuary and he wants to live amongst us once the sanctuary is built. In other words, Ham Shachas Ike Shechina Vashachanti, Lamata Ba'aras, to bring down the highest level of Shechina, which the Rebbe called earlier. You live of Chinas Reimamos and save of Kol into this world, and in order to do this, you have to have Meishar Abayin. Agam Shedarsh Chazal, even though it says in Chazal, but Shachanti Betech Betech Kol Achad Vechad Mi Yisra, we know that building this base on Mikdash and the Eibush, the rest is by every single individual Jew, not just by Meishar Abayin. Who says the Rebbe Harei Ain Ingin Yitzim Midei Pshutei? Top of page Peyalef. Now there's a literal version of the story. What is the literal version of the story? The Shechina rests in a physical sanctuary. Okay? Three lines on the top of page Peyalot. Meishelabeinu's task is to bring down the Shechina from the lowest of the heavens to this earth. Through him, he is the one who gives the instruction and provides the possibility spiritually and physically to build the Beis HaMikdash. In other words, I'm skipping a line. So although the purpose is for the whole world and the task is for all people, but Moshe Rabbeinu has a critical role to play. Because Moshe Rabbeinu is the one who brings the Shechina back down into this earth. And Meishah Rabbeinu facilitates that when the Shechina comes down to the third, you should have a place to stay. So Moshe sets it up. So even though we do it, or we complete it, Moshe Rabbeinu's role is central in this. Moshe Rabbeinu is the Shvi, the seventh tzaddik. His mom should chin at a place, I was at a place, I was at a fabring on Sunday night. So before the formal event, I spoke to some high school girls. So they're asking me an uncomfortable question. I've been asked this question before. 
How long is a generation? Now, of course, you understand where the spirit of the question is coming from, and how long are you going to say where the Rebbe is chesidim before the Shia? This was the title. How long is the generation? So I answered the question with a question. The Rambam lists 40 generations from Meisha Rabbein to Chesim HaSatalmut, the end of From the uh, time of Meisha Rabbeinu until Chesim HaSashas is somewhere between 1500 and 2000 years. It's a very long time. You can, you can figure it out. We left Mitzrayim in 2448, right? The second base of Mikdash was destroyed in 3828. From 2448 till 3828 is 1400 years. Come on. Target 1400 years, yeah? Chichsim is about 300 years after that. Or 400 years after that. So you're talking now about, how much should I say? 14. It's 17, 1800 years. It's a very, very long time. So I said to these girls, how do you have 40 generations in 1700 years? 40 generations in 700 years, a generation is somewhere between 40 and 50 years. 42, 40, a generation is 42 years. Nobody counts a generation 42. The generation is 20 years. 25 years. That's the first thing with <laughs> So I told the girls, a generation is a tzaddik. And if you look at that Ambam, when he counts the 40 generations, the first generation is Mesha. Second generation is Yeshua. The third generation is uh, Pinchas ben Elazar ben Nadna Kayin. And the fourth generation is Eli Akayin. The fifth generation is Shmuel Anoy. And the sixth generation is Davin Hamel. And I believe the seventh generation is God Hanavi. And the eighth is already Eliyahu. And Eliyahu. The amount of time that passes between the third generation, fourth generation, is hundreds of years. Now it could be Eliezer lived a very long life, it's possible. But it could also be that until there was no new Nasi, he was the Nasi. So the Nasi gives a derech. And the derech holds, as I said, what's a generation? A generation is a Rebbe. That's what a generation is. Meisha Rabbeinu was the seventh generation, but it revolves around him personally. He's the seventh generation as an individual man. And he brings the Shekhinah Lamat So although the whole generation and all of history has that task, but it's centered on Meisha. And if Meisha Rabbeinu was the seventh, the central task of building the Evishter home centered on him specifically. So there's this interplay between all of us doing it and the role of the Tzadik, the Rebbe, the Nasi. And the Rebbe chooses in this particular moment to point this out. That although it's all of our jobs, there's something very, very specific in this job that relates to Meisha Rabbeinu specifically. And as I told you, the job is accomplished by struggling. So I'm going to continue on page Peyalef. Eight lines in the top. The Mishkan is made from boards called Shittim. And of course, you know what the word Shittim means. Shittim is from the word Shtus, folly, foolishness. And there's the foolishness of the world, which is less than reason. And the avoid is to transform the foolishness of the world to foolishness, which is more than reason, that we call this year Shtus, the Gdush. And then he says, Shamehem Nasu Akrash. What took this board called Atze Shit and made from it Kiroshim. What is Kiroshim? What's the shadish of the word Kiroshim? Kedesh. Kuf, Reish, Shit. And when Shikosov, as the Pasuk says, the Ossiso es a Kiroshim la Mishkan Atze Shit. And then you take these boards of Atze Shit. You stand them vertically and you make from them Kiroshim. And then it says, Kedesh, Uesi es Sheket. Kedesh, which means a board, is the same letter as the word Sheket, which means a lie. Vuhu wa sheke de elu, which is the lie of this world. Habo me ashtus de liyumazeh, which comes from folly, from foolishness, from klipa. Ein adam eved aveda. Elim ke nichnas beiru ashtus. And when we transform the shtus of this world into shtus de gedusha, we transform the sheke into this world of this world into a kedesh and a keshe in the beis hamikdash. Next paragraph. Vehine ayadei ashtus de liyumazeh. Because there is evil in this world. And there is a falseness in this world. Which opposed to Kedusha. So you have to have Shtuz the Kedusha to oppose it. You have to have Keresh and Kesha to oppose it. In other words, if the world would be a perfect world, we would all serve Hashem in a reasonable way. But because the world is not a perfect world, we have to struggle. And these struggles, we don't like them. But these struggles bring out deeper questions. And the Rebbe goes on to say, It arouses the attribute called Netzach. Netzach means 
determination, victory of the Abishta, which is called Netach Yisrael Yishak, the victory of the Abishta. The Rebbe brings in the mind an example for this. The blame in Nagid that the king has no opponents, any Shaykhi, any Tachan cloud, the king doesn't have to dig deep into his Pneumius, into his subconscious, and reveal a Mida called Netzach. Manig Machusiki Chefti. He governs his nation like his desire. Only when there's an opponent, you have to have Midas and Nitzach. The reason for this. The physical king to bring out his midas and nitzach. Who daf because yesh menaged requires an opponent. Because the supernal mid of netzach meseired as had the menaged daf is aroused by the eibush tekvayachol having an opponent. But the chenasa came gam lamata. The reason down here people fight when there is opponents is because up there people fight because there are opponents. Because the Abishta wants that the physical earth should reflect the mind. Now, what's Midas Hanetzach? Midas Hanetzach is a simple meter. When you have to fight and win, there's no sophistication. It's simple. It's like pounding your head against the wall. But because it's simple, it's like a fist. Your fingers can do very, very, very sensitive work. They're very dexterous. But fingers don't have that much power. They make a fist, an egg rape. The sophistication of the fingers is gone, but the force of the fist is much stronger. Midas HaNetzach is simple. And in the Yilash Nechassidus, it's atzmi, it's power, it's from the Pnei Misan Shom. It's a very, very powerful force. And a king especially has Midas HaNetzach. But you bring it out only when there's opposition. A king is involved in sophisticated things, in fancy things. When does a king become simple and determined when he has an opposition? And the Rebbe says, the on such a high level in the nefesh. And Lamailo, to defeat this opponent, the king reveals, Avish reveals his treasure which is on high. The mind continues. This example of a physical king. Skip the bracket. When a king needs to win a war, particularly if it's a war of survival, which is called Mohammed's Nitochin, who Mevaz Beis, he splurges, calls Segulas, ages, all the hidden treasures, which collected over the course of many years from generation to generation. The eights, they say, you cut him at the eights, and these treasures are so valuable to him. doesn't have to use them. doesn't show them at all. Last three words on page Peyal of Alpha Pekin, nevertheless. Bishfil turn over your page. Feel the Tua Hamochoma. To win the war in Elaid Akshum Megalas H says he not only reveals these treasures, Vilaid Akshum Mishtamish Ben, not only use these treasures, Elashum of Vazbezis. He gives them out recklessly. Who does he give them to? The generals. But why is he giving them to the generals for the common foot soldier to have these Aitzes to win the war? So this is the deal. You have a Mochoma. Because you have opponent, you have Muhammad, and the opponent is a behemoth, there's the Yumaze and a Sheker, which has to be formed into, into a carbon for the Abish Teresh, there's the Gdusha and a Keresh. Who is going to fight this war and win it? The Tzivis Hashem. The Abish wants the Tzivis Hashem to win it, so he gives them a Koyach. And what is this Koyach? The Ifan Eitzel Elyon. And then, of course, the Maimah Bosil Lagani says, Lohovin Inyan Ha'Eitzel Lamailo. Whoever wants to explain the meaning of the word treasure, Lamailo. And the Rebbe says, if you look inside seven lines, the top of page Pei Beis, the Rebbe begins with a Moshuk Mosaic. Godliness is the highest of the heights to the lowest of the lowest. It's the supernal treasure has many levels. And the Rebbe says something here which I never saw before. The Rebbe says the lowest level of this treasure is called Oitzel Shal Yira Shamayim, the treasure of the fear of heaven. And then the Rebbe says there's higher levels of this treasure. And the highest level of this treasure is called Oitzel Ha'amiti, the truth of this treasure. In other words, the Rebbe divides the Oitzel into three madregas. The lowest level is Oitzel Shal Yira Shamayim, the second is higher levels, and the third is Oitzel Amiti. And I want you to know, I've never seen this before. I was, I, I was at the Fabreng when the Rebbe said this, Mike, which of course makes me look terrific. Eh? Yeah, I was 17. It isn't, it isn't an excuse. 
But the bottom line is, the Rebbe says there's Madregis in the Yitzit, and the lowest Madregis in the Yitzit is Yira, but Bechlau doesn't say that. Bechlau, we say the Madregis in the Yitzit is only one thing, and Yitzit, and Yira, Shammai, and Yira, and Hashem, he Yitzari is the highest Madregis. And the Emes Tarachian, why here, he makes Yira Shammai with only one Madregis. And then he says, the Yitzit is Nitan. Eight lines in the end of the paragraph. This treasure is given over Ace from the Bisbos, Litzivis Hashem. To the army of Hashem, we'll have to fight this war, Lamat. Right? Look at the end of the paragraph. It's not a base. I want to tell you something. We've learned Bas for many years. I've learned Bas for many years. Okay? Bas Lagani has a long discussion on this Tikunizir. Why? Because he wants to explain the Abish's treasure. So he explains it by explaining this expression, and he says, What does Lamaila and Ketz mean? Nobody knows what godliness is. What does it mean? That godliness is everywhere. I'm going to say it again. In the Bosi Lagani, this Tikkun Ezer is explained over the course, I think, of five truck. And what does he explain? means nobody knows what it is. Ain't sof lamata the tachos means nobody is able to shut it out. You have godliness in the sewer. Godness is everywhere. So the kavona of the tikkun Isaiah and in bringing ain't sof lamata tachos is to say what? That godness is everywhere and that godliness is revealed everywhere, even the lowest places. So as they say in Yiddish, the Rebbe Machsach Nish Vissendik, he literally misquotes the Maimon and builds his own mind. Now, the Rebbe's not making a mistake. <laughs> the Rebbe is doing what the Rebbe does. He says, when you say that godliness goes to the lowest madregis, that means that there's two things. The posh, the pshat, and my man. What's the posh, the my man? That even the lowest places you have godliness. But there's another thing that this my man is saying, even though the man doesn't mean to say it. And what is that? Who is responsible for the lowest places? God. Correct? The Abish that created the lowest places. Why are the Abish to create the lowest places? Because he wants us to bring godliness to those lowest places. Now normally, that's what the focus is. The focus is that even the lowest places, you can find God. So the Rebbe spins it. And says, even the lowest places are creations of God. In other words, the lowest place in this mime is going to be discussed. Not because of the godliness that's going to be revealed there, but because of the klipa. That it is. So the Rebbe takes the Basi Lagani and reads it wrong, so to speak. Look at the next paragraph. We must understand this lowest of levels. How bad it can get. That's the title of his words. How the lowest of the low, not how the lowest of the low is filled with godly life. How the lowest of the low is low. <laughs> so you understand that was not the previous Rebbe's kavon. The Rebbe is quoting the Friedrich Rebbe incorrectly to make a different point. The previous Rebbe explains in chapter 13, skip the bracket. The different levels of how low things can get. Number one, the spiritual worlds of which are holy but low. Number two, you see I made Roman numerals on your page. Worlds of Klippa. Number three, klipas pari. You have a klipa called pari. Pari is such a valgaive that pari is not only an independent operator, he's an atheist. He denies the Abishter altogether. So the Rebbe says there's madregas and klipa. And then he says, you know what the madregas and klipa? Because there's madregas in shtus by a person. So if you look six lines from the bottom of the page, he introduces different madregas of shtus by a person. Number one, I'm reading six lines from the bottom of the page, pay base. First, it leaves a little bit away from the correct path. Number two, first you go off the right path a little bit. In other words, you like yourself a little bit. Then you become completely consumed by tires. Number three, you fall to Avedis. And number four, the fourth madreg is not only are you involved in Klippa, not only are you taken over by Klippa, not only are you involved in Avedas, you're doing it of Tzalachas. Who created all of this evil? 
the Amish to themselves. And the question of our Maimed is not how could godliness be there, is but why the Amish that created evil and why we talk about it so much. So our Maimed is not going to analyze the godly presence in these low worlds, but the low worlds themselves, and this we'll do on Thursday.